my mindset, uh, having a two-year-old who I said would never act up in a supermarket, would never have any problems, uh, that because my child was going to always behave, you know, that mindset, and then you quickly learn about that, to all the way uh, having a 25-year-old and realizing some of the things that I stressed that, that was important to her uh, helped diminish her self-confidence as an adult. And this was never my intention. I only had good intentions, but I screwed up. And I'm here to try to help other parents because the only thing I can do going forward because I can't change my behavior in the past is try to help you uh, understand those things. And a developing young mind is very different than an adult mind. And sometimes we treat them as if they are an adult and that is they can't handle some of the things that we may think is just making them tough or just helping them out. It doesn't help them, and you realize when they're older, oh crap, whoops. So we just wanted to go through certain things of what helped. A lot of this is going to be Dr. Michael Renson, but I asked, can I please uh, start it out and um, give some of the experiences I've had and try to help you so that I get uh, a little background on me, my name is Cassie, I own Gym Cats, and my kids uh, grew up in this gym. Um, and I would recommend, if I had to do it all over again, I would never coach them. So I recommend no one ever coaches their kids. I think it's not healthy for them mentally. You may think, I have the best intentions, so I'm going to help them get really good. It's the worst thing for them. So I will back up with that. Anyway, what is good parents? Uh, parenting. So first to me, the obvious things, you give them a roof over their head, you feed them, you take care of their needs, you teach them healthy habits, that kind of thing. That's to me very obvious. Uh, but what about the, the less obvious things? Is it important for you that your child obeys whoever is telling them what to do? Is that important? Does anybody have an opinion on that? <laughs> so I have a problem with the word obey in a period because obey means blindly follow. And to me, there are some adults I don't think you should blindly follow. So, but some people, you know, are old fashioned and believe you just listen to adults. And I just don't, I don't agree with that. Is it, uh, what if they act disrespectful to somebody else? No one wants that, no one thinks that's a good thing, but I can tell you when my kid acted disrespectful and I hammered down on her, I, that's what I regret the most. So how you handle when your kid is disrespectful definitely influences how they grow up as an adult. So a lot of times when a kid is acting out disrespectful, rolling their eyes, they act like they don't care what you say, there's something they need or there's a problem. And I wish I had realized that when I was raising my kids a lot more that they, she's not just being a disrespectful jerk. That, that, wasn't, that wasn't what she was being, but that's what it appeared to me. And I wasn't gonna let my kid act up like that. So disrespect is hard. Are they allowed in their sport to just kind of slack off? pay a lot of money, what if they're not working hard on a day or two? What, is that okay with you as a parent? There's, there's sometimes a reason they're slacking off. Um, there's a bunch of different issues there. Um, what if they're acting super selfish? Lots of kids do that. Very, very common. So just things to think about, but I thought I'm going to change them. And instead, you know, and I'm going to change them by Tell them they're wrong and you're not going to act like this, you're punished, all that kind of stuff. And to me, that is my biggest regret um, to have you done. Um, things you might not think about, uh, it's very important to be in control of things. So do they have choices? Do you give them choices? Do they have some autonomy over their life? It's really important for kids to feel like they have some control. So what do you let be their control? And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, but their sport should be their sport. Uh, we just did a, a lecture downstairs for the coaches, and we all agree, the more the parent gets involved, the more the kid backs off. So if it's too much uh, 
partnership sport, where it's their sport and your sport, they tend to back off and do less. That's what we've done. We want them to follow their own passion. Is this their passion? Are you making them do something you want them to do, or is it something they want to do? Be really careful of that as well. Uh, it needs to be something that they, they is their, is their own sport. You know, we have a lot of, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this, but a lot of parents who say, I need her to get her leg straight on her back hand. You do? And is that important? Well, she's got to move up. Is that important too? Well, you don't want to feel like a failure when the other kids move up and she didn't. Really? Does that matter? Try to ask yourself these questions. It's really important that they don't feel judged by you. They're being, the coaches are telling them the errors they're making in the gym. The judges, in a way, are telling them what they've done wrong because they score them off. They're constantly being told by their teammates, if you don't have that skill, I have it. <laughs> being judged, right? So what does that do to their self-esteem? Uh, they want to, number one, feel from you that they love them, doesn't matter what they do. That's a really important side of parenting, and I can't tell you how far that goes and how much that gives them if they feel that unconditional love. Okay, so pressure. I have uh, probably a billion and one different um, examples of what pressure has done to kids, and this is the regret I have with my daughter, who the pressure was too much for her, and it just definitely led to, to things that I didn't like. But what I've witnessed, a parent uh, who's taking their kid, we've got to go uh, practice at in on the bed, we have to practice at the park, we've got to get that round up our hamstring, we've got to keep working, 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 and they're pushing them, and guess what happens? Mental blocks. The hardest, most frustrating thing. The kid is in agony, they want to do it and can't. The parent is like, oh my God, they want to do it, what can I do? And there's nothing you can do about it, unfortunately. And it, it's really, really hard. We've been through a lot of kids with mental blocks, and it's almost always come down to this is way too important. So this sport is my entire life. This business and, and you know doing it and trying to get kids to achieve their best, that's my entire life. But if you make it too important, then it just creates, I call them bricks on their shoulders, and they're just paralyzed. They cannot do so. It's, it's unbelievable. The other thing I've seen from pressure, the, the kid who's to your parent, I remember I was listening to her and I'm, okay, so what do I need, uh, need to do to get her leg straight on her back handspring? And after I listen to the conversation and the, it's going on and on, and I go in and I look at this cheer kid in there and I'm like, she does not care about getting her leg straight. <laughs> she does not care. That is not in her thing. In fact, I think sometimes because the parent cares about that, makes the kid kind of rebel and not care about it. Oh, you know, you want me, you want me to clean my room too. I don't really want to do that. You want me there again. You want me to do back with a straight leg. I don't really care about that now. Now, for a culture, it was her decision to care about her straight legs. Guess how quickly those legs get straight in comparison to you wanting her to get her legs straight. And then self-esteem is very important. It does diminish self-esteem if they have pressure from you. Uh, you know, the other boy over there, he did this. With that girl, you know, she was doing that. And you beat her by that. And that self-esteem starts creeping in. That you're not their biggest fan. Well, why doesn't my mom or dad think I'm the greatest? So, if, if I watch the kids who, in competition, their parents just think they're amazing. And guess what those kids do? They're like, I'm amazing. <laughs> you know, it helps. It, it really, really, really does. And when you point out, well, you know, your friend over there stuck the landing, what's wrong with you? Or it cuts them. It really, really hurts them. And the anxiety is another thing. Uh, the stomach ache. There's an article that uh, Jill had shared with me a while back, and it said if they say, I have a stomach ache, it usually means they have anxiety. I can't be in there. So when you start having, sometimes there's aches and pains that don't really make sense, or stomach ache that's happening way too often. Sometimes there's anxiety there. So just watch out um, for, for that. Um, and then this is, but what if what if all that results and I get it? I have a kid who's lazy. I can't handle that. I'm working two jobs. I'm paying all this money at the gym and I'm doing this. You gotta, you 
got to weigh, well, is that so important to you that you're willing to risk all this other stuff because your kid's not working as hard as you want them to? If you have any anecdotes or questions or anything, just feel free to stop me because I want it to be a conversation and not just a lecture. Yes. I have a, a personal experience with the stomach ache thing. Like my son was having stomach ache that turned out to be directly from anxiety and it took a really, really long time to figure that out. And if I had been to this meeting, for example, it would have even like set off some light bulbs a little bit earlier. Um, but like looking back, it's so obvious because it happened in conjunction with specific activities. Um, but it's real. Like, you know, it's real. Stomach pain doesn't not exist. No, it exists. It exists. But it's it directly a result of anxiety and no to do So if you keep having those things that don't exactly add up, I feel like I'm feeding them healthily, or they sing, they go to the doctor, they don't really say much of the problem, they don't have the whole bowel issue or anything going on. Why do they keep having this happen? There's usually some reason behind it. So understanding and love, show the love. If they can't open up, yes? I have a question about um, the pressure thing, because you know, before you know we're working, we're a work in progress here. But it's hard. But now it's turned into you're just saying that because you have to be your mom. Like I'm like, you're one thing that's beautiful. You did that, that was great, baby. Well they, like, you're saying that because you have to be your mom. Yeah, I get that as well <laughs> from from my daughter. Uh, she doesn't really have anything good about her now as an adult. <laughs> and uh, I just say things that are good because I'm not her mom, but otherwise there's nothing really good about her. You know, it's yeah. really hard to, you know, go through and listen to and like, wow, does she really believe this about herself? This is hard. Yeah. Um, so they, you still are building it. It doesn't mean quit trying. Yeah. Um, but they, they have to build it from the inside. And um, anybody ever read the book by Carol Dweck, Mindset? If I had read that before I parented, I think I would have done things a lot better. Because you say mistakes, problems, things that they're learning experiences. They're just growth. And fixed is uh, you fell, you're no good, you see, didn't stick, you know, whatever. Fixed. So we want to always do the growth mindset. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, as an educator and, and a mom of many, um, <laughs> one of the things that I find that I help that helps with my children and my students because I teach students with intellectual disabilities. So I'm constantly trying to help them feel good about themselves because they always feel like the stupid one. Is that I just constantly remind them with they say something like, oh, well, you have to say that or whatever. And it's like, well, aren't you so happy? I believe in you. Aren't you so happy? I don't believe in you. I can't. You know, just reminding them that, well, you're stuck in that and lucky for you, I see this in you. So I don't know if that helps at all, but. A mindset by Carol Dweck. Mindset. I have a question. Um, you kind of mentioned mental blocks. And um, do you see that maybe sometimes you'll notice mental blocks that are coming from necessarily not pressure at the gym, but pressure outside, maybe school or something that's related mm -hmm. and is coming into the gym and causing the mental block? Um, I'm not, I haven't found a correlation between something outside me and school. Um, but really, if any pressure in any sense of it, okay, and it manifests itself. Yes, and, but usually to me, the most, the thing that I found the most is pressure on this being so important that they do this. Like the more you tell me, I have to get this to go to the next level, the more it stops them. So it's how important it is. You know what? You don't, you get it, you don't get it, you go to the next level, you don't, you don't, da da I'm going to love you no matter what. And um, I think that's what stops it the most. So trying to do, minimize the importance of that. Well, did you learn stuff from the sport? Do you like doing it? Do, you know, all these other things. Are you, are you making friends on your team? Do you support each other? Do you speak positively? I have, um, Sophia is one of my examples. She, I told her, you are my future coach. She gets off the equipment and she worries about the other kids. And she goes, you did a great job giving me a high five. I'm like, I'm gonna hire you. <laughs> Amazing, like just so, positive and that, that is a, an amazing quality she goes outside herself the ones who are a little bit more stressed and always you know I have to have this you know they don't even have the ability to do that so at least she's relaxed enough to do that you know she can get on on herself but it, at least she's relaxed enough to go caring about the other kids and I think that's great um, 
So I've had a bunch of parent meetings over the years, many, 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 many. And usually, I'm a type A personality, we're gonna do something, we're gonna fix it, right? That's what usually is happening. I get that, we all wanna do that. But I keep getting parents come in and say, I told them to work on their this or that. I told them this, I told them, I told them, I told them. I say stop telling them. Start asking questions, like ask them, ask them, well, what do you think you need? You're the expert here, honey. What do you think you need to do? And they usually know, especially when it's mental. When it's mental, you cannot tell them what to do. It's from here. What do I feel? Just like she just said, she can't make her daughter feel confident. It has to come from within. There are things you can do that make it worse, for sure. We've been through that with you. With you. And I've done it too. I've made it worse. Um, but there are... You, they have to build that confidence. And people build it at different rates. So they don't know oh, by eight, you should be, uh, you know, it's not like that. Um, also, when you're asking questions, be careful not to steer them to a terrible place called victim land. So you are asking, we've had this, you know, so you're asking questions to them. What do you think you can do to get this? How do you think you can overcome it? What What is it? Do you need help with uh, me? and communicating with your coaches with you because you might have trouble with that. What do you need? Those are fine questions. You say stuff like, well, did Coach Elena let you even work your car bill today? <laughs> well, didn't, didn't you see Missy? She took a whole bunch more turns than you. I mean, are they not letting you take as many turns? And then guess what? <laughs> I, I can't, and they're not letting me. I would be there already if only those people weren't stopping us. And I guarantee you, at least at this gym, we have no agenda of this one getting to there and that one getting to there. I promise you, promise you, promise you that that's not a concern for us. We want everybody to reach the best they can. And so if we could have everybody be at the very top, of course, we would. Uh, build them up. So that's that genuine love and praise. Because one girl I had from the Olympics, the girl who made it to the Olympics that I coached there, her mom only talked about how amazing she and she said, yeah, you know what? I think you're the best in the world. This is when she, she was not the best in the world. You know what? I don't think anybody can beat you, Joshua. I think you're the best in the world. She was a high level, and she was good. But the best in the world. That's what her mom thought. And she actually believed it. Her mom believed that. And we were just like, okay. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, stay out of it. To me, um, I uh, we adopted two kids from Africa. And one of them had zero parenting. He was the fifth born. Mom's overwhelmed. He never went to school because they beat him at school because he couldn't read because he never went to school. And he is the most well-adjusted child who had absolutely no parenting. He had a bend for himself. He's the reason he got adopted because he, you know, had such great people skills. Uh, so sometimes I'm like, you know what? Are we, maybe we'd be better off not parenting so much. So that's, that's a little bit, uh, I mean, I'm joking, obviously, you would want your kid to learn to read. <laughs> you know, and, and obviously, you want to help them brush their teeth and stay, you know, out of the hospital. And he didn't really have that either, so, and he could have probably got run over by, by a motorcycle because that's how it was there in Uganda. But, um, you know, so obviously, there's extremes, but the more we hover and get involved, I, I find more problems almost. So, hey. You're the expert, honey. And it actually, if you actually believed it, it's liberating. I'm here to support, and here you go. I'm going to trust you. It's liberating. But it's hard to believe because a type A personality like me is, i got to be doing something to help my kid. i got to be a good parent. i got to do something. So I think that also stems from, like, just the way you were raised yourself, where you just don't want oh, sure. your kids go down that same path. That sure. Well, there's a lot of issues with how the parents' mentality is and why they do what they do. We could get into that and go, well, why did I do that? Why do I feel the need to, my kid to overachieve? And why do I not feel worthy here or as a parent? Or I feel judged or, you know, there's a whole bunch of issues there as well. But it's, you know, we're trying to end the cycle of whatever was put on you by your parents to uh, go forward with them. Um, I'm, I'm done. I just quickly have, this is um, <laughs> education videos. They're kind of comedy videos, but that point out the overzealousness but we have that on our website, our YouTube page, uh, just to look up if you're wanting an entertainment um, 
factor in, in telling you, oh, okay, I, I might be doing some of that, you know, and, and I think it's a really, really um, good way to kind of expose some of that. All right, now we are on to Dr. Michael Remsen, who's uh, a lot more of an expert in so many areas. Not true. <laughs> he is. Uh, but he was a very, very high level elite coach in gymnastics. He was assistant coach at Stanford University. He's uh, assistant athletic director at Georgetown University. He's now at East Davis. But he has had, he's had so many different experiences and knows the sport inside and out. But he's uh, definitely helping in the parenting world as well. So I'm going to change the technology. So what I'd like you to do, if you don't mind, is stand up and introduce yourself to a parent nearby. Your name and the thing you love most about your child. Ready, set, go. about, consult, teach about human performance, both at individual and group levels. And I would call your family a group, a team, in some ways. So I was very grateful to come here this weekend. Cassie brings me in every so often to work with her staff to try to help them figure out how do we perform at a higher level. There's always a theme. And this year's theme was about culture. And so Cassie pointed out, we got these things on the slides. And we asked the coaches to do yesterday was, let's talk about USA Gymnastics, what went badly in the last few years because I think it's a cultural issue. I have a little bias because that's a thing I study and care about a lot, but I also love the sport of gymnastics. It's made me who I am, so I wanted to get the coaches to kind of dig into what is it about. So we created a framework I'm gonna talk about a little bit about culture um, and why parenting is sort of a cultural challenge too, especially if you're gonna have your kids involved in the gymnastics business. Unfortunately, the culture of youth sports has kind of gone crazy the last few years. And there are a lot of different examples out there. But I'm going to show you a few minutes. And we know George Stephanopoulos. This is on Good Morning America or whatever thing he's on. A couple minutes about what's happening in youth sports right now. An Oklahoma referee who was calling foul on the bad behavior of parents at their kids' games by posting videos like this online. He first learned about it in the New York Times. Paul Harris here with the details. Tough to watch. Hey, good morning, George. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, this ref is posting these videos to hold parents accountable for creating a toxic environment at youth sporting events. The abuse has become so bad that the National Association of Sports Officials says over 70% of refs quit the job within the first few years. They are the sideline antics giving new meaning to poor sport. Parents caught on tape behaving badly while watching their kids play Little League and soccer. And now an Oklahoma father and referee is attempting to stop parents from acting like out of control children by publicly shaming them on this website. The fact that we want our kids to love the sport instead of yelling and screaming like every other uh, crazy parent out there, go pull your kid if you don't like it. Brian Barlow is offering $100 for videos that show parents <laughs> acting foul on the sidelines. Barlow then posts these videos to Facebook, his page featuring this soccer spectator. You are horrible! You are horrible! And this all-out brawl. It's more than no tolerance. It's substance to no tolerance. Like, this is what happens if you act like this. 
This is what could happen. You could end up on a video that ends up on offsite on Facebook that ends up in front of 250,000 people. According to the National Association of Sporting Officials, nearly 40% of officials believe parents cause the most problems with sportsmanship. And over 64% of refs have had to eject spectators from youth games for bad behavior. As for Barlow, he says parents' aggressive behavior is creating a shortage of youth soccer referees. And his videos are already changing their behavior towards referees. In the moment, you don't realize what you look like or how you act. So when you go back and you do see how you acted, that changes behavior. So you may have noticed a shortage of refs or arms at your kids' games. Maybe they were canceled because of it. Let's talk about that for a moment because it... I don't really care about soccer refs. <laughs> <laughs> now the good news is, have you been to a gymnastics meet and seen a fist fight break out between parents? No. Not yet. <laughs> I think we do better than most other sports, but this is actually a thing that's happening. It happens in youth sports, it happens in college sports. I have to deal with parents on a fairly regular basis who lost their minds over something that's happening with their adult child. <laughs> so, feedback on that, for starters, what's going on? What do you think? And we're going to sit in judgment here for them because we're not them, we're better parents than them. What's going on with those people? I had a daughter on a club soccer team and the coach made every game seem like the FIFA cup. <laughs> so there were a few dads that were very extreme on the, on the sidelines. I was um, pretty embarrassed. I'd like sit in the corner because they would scream at the refs, scream at the kids. They lost it because in their head, every game mattered so much, and the and the coach would yell at the team if they won like by one point. If they won by one point, that's nothing. So it's like the parents were trying to keep the kids from being yelled at by like trying to give them some self edge or something. I don't know. It was. It was like, well, we, we left just in the middle of the season because I couldn't mm. take the, the craziness that was going on with, with that team. But, but I think for the parents, they just felt this pressure. And I kept going, it's not the FIFA Cup. Like, it's, it's kids' soccer. It's They're ten. stress, <laughs> yeah. which comes from a variety of places. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. And any other thoughts on? See, I feel like we get judged as parents. No. Because... Oh my gosh, your 10 year old goes five days a week. How does she get their schoolwork done? How does she do this? When does she eat? You know, all of this. So, is parenting a competition now a little bit? Apparently. Mm -hmm. Totally. <laughs> and I think also a little about selfishness because sometimes, you know, I've, I've heard parents say, well, I left work early, I drove all the way here, and you couldn't even play very well. So, parenting yeah. shame is a wonderful thing. I've been shamed my entire life as a child, I can tell you, it's super effective in developing healthy I'm still in therapy about that. Yeah. Other thoughts, Adrian? There's a culture that exists in at the game that allows people to act that way where they would never act like that in another situation. Right. So culture is a really important thing. There's a culture in sports that's really different. So I, I work at a university now, and part of my job is teaching and coaching coaches, but also helping them to get better. Because there's a permissiveness in sports culture that says passion is cool. So I've had coaches that are crazy people, and you can probably figure out what sports they're in, who think the right thing is to yell up, jump up and down, scream, throw their hats, and yell at officials. And everybody goes, that's cool, he's really passionate. <laughs> and then I try to help them frame, okay, if you went into the classroom and you were teaching the French class, <laughs> would that be acceptable? No! Well, in sports, it's okay. And then we watch ESPN, and what's the 10 highlight show? It's the guy in the dugout whacking the cooler with the baseball bat, and people flipping out. So to me, there's a broad cultural question about what the heck are we doing in sports? Fortunately, there's some bright spots, and I, and I think it's somewhat in reaction to that. If you've been following things lately, and Wimbledon's happened today, so I thought this was appropriate. Does anybody follow the story of Coco Gauff? Yes. Anybody want to share? The 15-year-old that beat Venus Williams in the first round. Yeah. Yeah. So this phenomenal 15-year-old who beat Venus Boyd and like won a couple rounds, I think, at one little before yeah. she lost in a quarter or something. And there's a part of my brain that goes, oh god, 15-year-old sports specialty, this child has no life, she's been stuck in a tennis academy. That raises all sorts of red flags. But the upside is they started to look at what are Coco Gauff's parents about? And Coco Gauff's mom actually has a meme now on the internet and an account that people are following because she's been a super healthy parent who's just there to cheer for a kid and doesn't care. There's a meme of Coco's mom dancing and people have interviewed them about what, how do you be great parents? And that's built on some other examples, the uh, Lamarone twins 
played women's hockey, and were, their parents were highlighted as being these super healthy, supportive parents. Chloe Kim, um, U.S. snowboarder who won a gold, I think, the last Winter Olympics. There are a few of those isolated instances, and they're news. Why is that news when parents are healthy and good? Uh, it shouldn't be news, that should be the norm, right? But that is because we have this overwhelming culture of it not being a thing. Um, we're a little ahead of schedule, so I, I want to show you a little bit of a TED Talk if I get the technology over. Anybody like TED Talks? So this is by a guy named John O'Sullivan, who is an elite soccer coach and player. And the first few minutes of this, I think, are pretty instructive. Every year. Sorry. Thank you. Every year in the United States, about 40 million children play youth sports. Yet 70% of those kids drop out and quit by the time they're 13 years old. Three out of four children are done with sports before high school. Now, as a person who's been involved in athletics his whole life, as a college and a professional soccer player, and a coach for the last 20 years, I wanted to know, why was this happening? Why did so many kids quit something that has made such a positive impact on my life? And then about three years ago, I realized the answer to that question. Standing on the sideline of my five-year-old daughter, Maggie Soccer. <laughs> Now, if you've ever seen five-year-old soccer, it's amazing. This is giant scrum of players. <laughs> and it moves up and down the field, giggling and laughing. Sometimes a player breaks out and scores in the right goal. Sometimes she takes it in the wrong goal. Twice the chance of success. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, right? She's happy, parents are positive, everyone's supportive. The coaches are positive, there's no referee to yell at. This is what sports is supposed to be. Well, on this particular day, there was a 10-year-old boys game right next door. And it should be just the same, right? But it was completely different. It was a competitive 10-year-old boys game. And I say competitive in quotes because it wasn't the kids who were competing harder, it was the adults. A kid makes a bad pass, ball gets stolen and the other team scores. And then all hell breaks loose. The coach jumps off his bench, he screams at the kid and he yanks him out of the game. Next, his dad is on the other sideline screaming at him. His, his, uh, parent, his friend's parents, they're screaming at him. And as I'm watching this, I'm saying to myself, wow, this is exactly why children drop out of sports. Because sports is supposed to be about children playing and children having fun and learning. And none of that is happening here. Now, I want to just invite you for a moment to get into the mindset of a 10-year-old boy or any young athlete today. It's very, very different than when I was growing up. You go to a game, and you're just going to play a game. But yet so many of the adults, they're acting like it's the World Series. <laughs> they're acting like it's the NBA Finals. And you're just there to play a game. There's coaches and parents screaming at you from the sidelines. Sometimes they're screaming at you, sometimes they're screaming at the referee, sometimes they're screaming at each other. Now you get in the car after the game, and you just want to relax and emotionally unwind, and yet this is the time when so many parents choose to deconstruct your game and criticize and critique your performance. And you sit around your kitchen table, and you hear your parents talking about the time and the financial commitment that it takes to play youth sports. Maybe you'll get a scholarship down the line to help pay for all this. And that just adds pressure and stress. And then finally, at the end of the year, the end of the season, when you're ready to move on to another sport, what happens? Your coach sits you down and says, uh-uh, you can't do that. You're not moving on. Because if you're going to stay on this team, you need to play year-round. And if you don't, I'm going to give your spot away. This is what so many children feel these days, this type of pressure. And that's why seven out of 10 of them quit new sports. Seven out of 10 are done. Now, I call this the, the great giant race to nowhere in new sports. And it's a race because so many kids and so many parents were in such a hurry to do more and more and more at younger and younger ages. 
And I say it ends nowhere because while we tend to focus on the few athletes who get a scholarship or turn pro, the vast majority end up somewhere else. They end up hating sports. They end up with damaged relationships with their parents. And for some kids, they end up with physical and emotional scars that last a lifetime. We have to end this great race to nowhere. We have to change the game in youth sports. We have to give it back to our kids. And today I want to tell you how we can do that. Now, some people say to me, oh, John, are you the anti-competitive guy? Trophies for everyone, no keeping score, no standings. Not, not at all. That is not me. I don't believe in participation awards. I don't think every kid who shows up should get a trophy just for doing the bare minimum. And as far as being competitive, I spent the last 20 years coaching elite youth soccer players. I spent four of those years as a Division I college men's soccer coach. So I know a little something about competitive athletes. And what I saw on that 10-year-old boys game, and what I see in so many sports all around the country, that is not it. These kids aren't becoming more competitive. They're not becoming better. They're becoming bitter. And they're dropping out of sports, seven out of 10 of them. Now what we've come to accept is this new environment in youth sports would never be acceptable anywhere else in life. We'd never accept it in our workplace. We'd never tolerate if our teachers treated our kids like this. And we would certainly never tolerate it if our children treated us in our events like we treat them. <laughs> Can you imagine what it would feel like in your golf game or your tennis match for our children? <laughs> well, <laughs> our friends at Hockey Canada, they've imagined such a thing. Check it out. Come on, Dad, focus. Why are you standing so <laughs> Don't slip. And don't screw up. It's the big thing. What are you doing? Keep on the ball. <laughs> you get the idea. I highly recommend, if you have time and are interested in watching the rest of O'Sullivan's TED Talks. What he points to is, I, I think, as I said, a cultural problem. So, how do you fix that? What do you do about culture? He's got a, a suggestion I'm going to close with later. But I want to start with six questions. It's a book by a guy named Patrick Lencioni, whose work I use a lot. And he talks about culture, which can be an overused word. But his suggestion for how to figure out what your culture is about is to, act, to be able to answer, to ask and be able to answer six questions. The questions are these. Why do we exist? Why are we here? How do we behave? What are the values, the core things we're committed to? What do we do? What are our actual actions? How do we measure our success? What's the most important thing right now? And who does what? And I'll put these up later. Six questions. And you might think, oh, that's about companies and stuff. But what I would suggest to you is, these are questions you should be able to answer for everything your child is involved in, because you should know the culture of the place that you're putting your child in for all those hours. But you should also know this for your team, which is your family. And a recommendation for success in life is knowing your culture and values and making sure they align with and match up with the place where you spend your time. For most of us, it's work. Anybody ever worked at a company where the values were just not aligned with you at all and you hated going to work every day because uh, this is just not a good fit? Same thing happens for your kids. And part of the reason gymnastics has had a cultural issue and sports has had a cultural issue is that parents have not been invested enough, in my opinion, in saying, hey, what are you guys about? And this is what we're about. And the reason I put my kids in sports is this, and that's why you train kids so cool, we match up. As opposed to, in the case of USA Gymnastics in general, for a long time, our job is to win medals at any cost. That's not good from my perspective on culture, and I was a part of it. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to meet your new friend you just introduced yourself to, and I want you to spend a couple minutes sharing with each other your why. Why is your child in gymnastics? Or cheer. Or cheer, sorry. Why is your child in the sport? What do you hope to get out of it? What's your why for them? Meet, meet a new friend, share a little bit, and then I'm gonna to wanna to hear from everybody. Ready, set, share. Sure.
burn some energy. Burn energy. She wants to be here. She likes it. Yeah, that's what she wants to do. Her joy. Confidence. Teamwork. Confidence. Discipline. Discipline. You've outsourced that job. <laughs>
the things that are asked of you are about 10% beyond what you're capable of doing. Just push you a little bit, but make you continually feel like, ooh, this is a good place. And most organizational dynamics folks would say the ideal goal for employees is to be stressed about 10% beyond what you're comfortable with. Not 20%, because then you go, oh, that's too much, I can't handle it. But if you're not stressed at all, how many of you had a job where it was just a sleepwalk existence every day? That's not good either, right? So you stress is an important condition for humans. It's a thing we like, it's a thing we need. Bad stress is distress. What does that look like? Well, it's generally unpleasant. It often takes energy. It can be short term on or long term. It decreases overall performance and can lead to all sorts of physical and mental health issues. What's an example of distress in your family? Nobody has bad stress in your family? No, uh, I just make my divorce. <laughs> Relationship changes. Ill parents, friends, relatives, death, employment, health insurance. All kinds of negative stresses in your lives. What's an example of distress in your child's life? Social media. Social media. Giant. They've got all sorts of them. So if you are a parent, your why is putting your child in sports. Do you want them to experience distress or distress? Would you want to add any more distress to their lives based on what they already deal with by putting them into a sport? I hope not, but we'll talk about that in a little more detail. So your challenge, I think, as far as what is our family culture and what's the place we're looking to be at, I want to be at a place that creates a eustress environment for my child that stretches them and helps them to grow in a positive, energizing, optimistic, intrinsically driven way. If I see my child experiencing any of the distress, not any, a little here and there mistakes happen, but if that's the predominant theme, ooh, that's not the thing I want my child to be a part of. Agree, disagree. And yet, what does youth sports look like today? Distress. Lots and lots of distress. A quick aside into your children's ability to handle stress, it turns out that that's changing too. How many of your kids have smartphones? Guess what? Everything you've heard is true. <laughs> We've actually shrunk the tissue in the brains of adolescents, the piece of their brain that deals with stress and resilience. We, meaning my generation especially, have designed technology that physically addicts them. Did you know that when they get a click, a light, a tinkle, or whatever the thing is on the phone that makes them happy, it actually causes the same brain reaction that a hit of cocaine, a winning gambling, sex or other pleasurable addictive activities cause. And guess what? When dopamine's excreted in your brain, you become addicted to a thing and you need to have it over and over and over again. What we've done with this is make something here available all the time. They no longer know how to cope with boredom or mind space. When you walk into Chipotle and you see a bunch of teenagers getting ready to get their burrito on, how long does it take before somebody pulls out their phone as they walk into the line and know they're going to have to wait three and a half seconds to be served? They have no capacity for boredom anymore because their brain is constantly occupied by this thing that wants to keep getting stuff generated, right? Well, guess what? Your ability to handle stress, to be resilient, is largely dependent on your ability to create distance from things, which some people would call mindfulness presence, being able to step back, being able to ruminate, daydream, be bored. We've taken that away from them. So they're far more subject to distress. They can't handle it as well, and yet we're piling it on in ever greater ways. Here's the role of stress in performance. One way to think about eustress and distress is a curve. Bell curves are every scientist thing, right? So this bell curve says, on the left, we're calm. In a performance state, eh, you might get a little better towards the end of that, but you might get a little bit bored. Use stress is that middle place of optimal performance where I'm energized, focused, in the flow, in the zone. I'm really challenged up just at that right amount. And then we get into the distress zone on the right side where I get fatigue, exhaustion, ill health, breakdown, and burnout. Where do you think most youth sports lives today? I would argue the culture's on the right side of the curve. 
even when the stakes are not that at all. What percentage of Division one college athletes make it into professional athletics? Anybody know? It? One percent. One percent of Division one college athletes make it into professional sports. Anybody know the percentage or the average length of career for professional sports in our major revenue programs? Two and a half years. So, if you think you're investing in gymnastics or cheer for your child to get a scholarship and make it as a professional gymnast or dancer, we should have a conversation. Because <laughs> those aren't the stakes. And if those aren't the stakes, what should our goal be? Our goal should be optimal performance, developing and growing children, right? So, why does this matter? I think, uh, and you can come out on this part if you don't like the science, but I think it's important for folks to understand a little bit what's going on. So, your brain is really where stress happens. Your stomach is where stress happens. Stress happens in your nervous system for the most part. So how do we experience distress? It's changed over time. I mean, you can see that graphic, but if you believe in that progression of evolution, if you look at the little green part, it stays about the same size, but the big blue part grows. So we still, 50,000 years after humans appeared, we still have the same lizard brain, the little green part. It hasn't changed very much. On top of that, we've evolved a big human brain that makes us different than animals in a couple of different ways. Number one is size. Our brain is bigger. It's got more folds, it's got more electrons, it weighs more. It burns a ton of energy. Fun fact for you that blew people's minds yesterday. You know how much of your resting daily caloric rate your brain burns? About 20 to 25 percent. The brain weighs about three and a half pounds, so it's a tiny percentage of your body weight, but it burns a tremendous amount of energy. So this big blue part that we've evolved is super powerful. And it's done an interesting thing for us. It's allowed us to be conscious of ourselves. I know that I am me. I have an inner narrative that's different from just reacting. Your dog does not know that dog is dog. Right? Fido cannot step back and go, I am Fido. I am separate from my feelings. Fido just feels stuff. The rest of the animal kingdom does not have this piece of your brain. This piece of your brain is your consciousness, your awareness, or simply it's the story you tell yourself. So how does the rest of the animal kingdom with a smaller brain experience stress? Pretty simply. Bad things. Ah, stress. Over. Oh, done. <laughs> That lizard part of your brain has four primal emotions. Fear, anger, sadness, and joy. Fear, anger, sadness, joy. How many of those are negative? How many of those are positive? Three negative, one positive. Why? That's the super primitive part that every living thing has. Evolution. Our cave ancestors, 50,000 years ago, when cave mice was sitting in the cave, if I was afraid or angry or sad, that helped me to survive. There was no survival benefit for being happy. Woo, have a good day. <laughs> Nobody cares. saber tooth tiger walks into the fire. Ah, tiger, run! You're slower than me. Feed the tiger. I live. I make more of us. I survive. Evolution is primed towards the negative. So that means, basically, we're three times more sensitive to negative than positive. That's how we were evolved 50,000 years ago. Guess how much that's changed? None. So from a biological perspective, our brains are still highly attuned to fear, anger, sadness, all those negative emotions. At the same time, this thing has evolved, so now we can step away from it. And all the legitimate danger has gone away. How many of you have recently had a family member taken by a saber-toothed tiger or a rival clan? <laughs> It can happen, but it's not really a thing anymore. And yet that part of our survival mechanism is still super strong. It tends to override everything else. And now that we have this thing that can tell us a story, guess what? Instead of being able to frame the story and say, well, I'm not really afraid to save a few tigers anymore. My life is good. Instead, I didn't get as many likes on Instagram. Nobody likes me. I feel really bad about myself right now. That's not a real survival threat, but because I have consciousness, I can start telling myself stories. So modern stress is less about threat to our lives. It's much more about the story we tell ourselves in our heads. And yet, guess what that story does? It triggers that primal stuff just the same. And what is that about? Well, it's part of your autonomic nervous system, there are two pieces to it. Your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic. The sympathetic is fight, flight, or freeze. 
That's the thing that allowed us to escape the tiger and live. Woo! Parasympathetic is rest and digest. So, in cave times, my job was to be chilling or run from the tiger. Go back and forth. Hopefully spend way more time chilling, very small amounts of time running from the tiger. Because that sympathetic nervous response, the sympathetic nervous system, is designed to run away from the tiger. How long does that last? Done. Oh, like a minute or two. Adrenaline. Done. Stress cortisol. Whew, time to go take a nap and chew on some mastodon. Whatever, right? <laughs> That's how it was meant to be. That system is still in place in a very different world. And here's what happens. We often are subject, and we saw in the video earlier, something called an amygdala hijack. I just like saying that. Here's what an amygdala hijack looks like. It means my lizard brain is taken over by the story I'm saying in my head. And my physical body responds like I have to fight off the tiger. Little league dad syndrome. Got one of the gender stereotypes. But when all that craziness happened on the sideline, was anybody under actual threat of death because the 10-year-old did not score the goal? No. And yet, what's the story some of those parents are telling themselves? Anger, disgust, fear, embarrassment, shame. And the story they tell themselves hijacks their lizard brain. And all of a sudden, they go into fight, flight, or freeze response and find themselves punching somebody, some other dad. And if they got it on video and watched it three hours later, most of them would go, oh my god, who am I? not to excuse their behavior, but part of it is, that's who you are, you're human. Your amygdala can easily get hijacked if you don't tell yourself the right story. All sorts of bad things happen under sympathetic nervous system response. Your body goes crazy, adrenaline comes flowing out. Anybody ever had like a near miss in the car? Like you looked away for a second, you screech, you go, oh my god, I almost hit the guy in front. And your heart's beating. Here's what else happens, your eyes narrow in, your focus tunnel vision. Stress cortisol floods your body. And then you get that little shaky thing after the adrenaline left out. Oh, God. It's okay. That's meant to happen short periods of time. When your children are under stress, under distress for long periods of time, guess what happens? Instead of it being a moment, it's a constant level of stress cortisol flooding their body. Think that's good or bad? bad for their health for all sorts of different reasons. It doesn't help performance. This is the thing I try to explain to coaches and people still resist the idea. If you yell at an athlete in competition, they go into sympathetic nervous system response. Do you think that's good or bad for performance? Bad. bad. Everything constricts. My vision tunnels in. I get a little bit shaky. My large muscles get a boost for a moment, but it's generally just bad. And yet we continue to put kids in that state for reasons that don't make any sense to me. Stress is about activating your kids fight, flight, or freeze. What's something that parents do that puts them into that mode? Not us, we're the good parents, but those other parents we're talking about. What can parents do to put their kids into fight, flight, or freeze mode? Stop that, no, stop, stop. What else? Think specific into our world of gymnastics and cheer. Not us, but the other bad gymnastics and cheer parents. What might they do that would put their kids into that kind of stress? Adrian. Great mistakes. If you don't get this, the bad thing will happen. Fear. Fight, flight, or freeze. Anger, sadness, fear. What else? How come so-and-so has it and you don't? Sadness, shame, embarrassment. I'm not at my 10% stretch. You're asking me to do a thing I cannot do. What else? Conditional love. Conditional love. What's that look like? I'm not gonna have the same affection for you. I will not love you as much anymore if you do that thing. What else? Or all of you like freaked out now, going over in your head all the things you've said for the last four years, going, ah, I'm the worst parent in the world. We're human, we all say stuff, but it's helpful to be conscious of what is the message you're sending 
Let's go back to our why. If their why is I want them to have a good time socially, burn energy, have fun, and exercise, what's the message I send her when I put her out on the floor? And when I pick her up, what should I say? Did you have fun today? Right. But if you want to engage your child in conversation, is asking closed-ended questions that can have a yes or no answer a good strategy with your surly teenager? <laughs> no. OK, close that off right away. That's a good question. John O'Sullivan, the guy in the TED Talk earlier, uh, popularized a phrase that I think is the single best piece of parenting advice I can give. I'd love to watch you play. That's it. And a lot of psychologists would say this now, the only thing you should say to your child when they come off the floor in a sporting performance event of anything is, man, I'd love to watch you do gymnastics. I'd love to watch you cheer. And if they say, well, you're saying that because you're my mom or my dad. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to watch you in your head be terrible at gymnastics. <laughs> so, what do you do about that? I hate to just pose a problem and not give you a solution. I, and I also want to talk just a little bit about a thing called mindfulness. Anybody familiar with this? Does anybody have an active mindfulness practice? Being present in the moment and not thinking about anything else except for what's going on. Yeah. So think back to that term amygdala hijack because I like that phrase for some reason. How do you prevent your amygdala from getting hijacked by all the stuff that's going on around you? If you're not mindful, here's what happens. External stress is happening. You're not a saber-toothed tiger, but I'm pissed off that your kid scored and my kid didn't. Yeah, anger. Here's what humans can do, because we have a giant brain. I don't have to react, I have a choice. Your dog has to react if it's angry. That's what it does. It can't create space between the thing that happened and what it's experiencing. As a human, I'm the only thing on the planet that can step back from that and go, wow, I feel angry right now. Why am I angry? And then choose to respond instead of react. Mindfulness is awareness that whatever I'm feeling right now is not reality. It's a thing that's passing through. It's temporary. And I have the ability as a human to step back and go, it's OK. I can choose to respond instead of react. It's essentially what mindfulness is. Sam Harris is uh, one, of the, one of the best books about this I've seen called 10% Happier. Highly recommend it. His definition of mindfulness is the ability to recognize what's happening in your mind right now, anger, jealousy, sadness, pain, without getting carried away by it. The ability to recognize what's happening in your brain right now without getting carried away with it. Getting carried away is an amygdala hijack. Sam has credibility on this. If you don't uh, watch the news, never watch him. He was famous for having a meltdown on national television. He was a news anchor and one day had an anxiety attack on national television. That uh, freaked everybody out. So we have to take a lead and figure out what the heck was this and how does it happen. And Sam is a self-confessed secular agnostic Jew. That's how he refers to himself. He doesn't believe in anything. He's a skeptic. So as he was trying to research, what do I do about this thing? How do I fix this anxiety thing I had? He came across the concept of mindfulness. Mindfulness. He was like, nah, no, 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 no. that's gooey crystals and granola stuff. That's not my thing at all. But he started trying it a little bit. That was really hard. And then he went to Harvard Medical School and met with a professor who told him, this is a thing. And in fact, we're examining the brains of Buddhist monks that do mindful exercises. And it turns out the piece of your brain that allows you to step away from an emotional moment can be developed with meditation. And Sam said, I don't meditate. That not me at all. But then he started trying it a little bit. And he went on a week-long meditation retreat, a silence retreat, and nearly lost his mind in the first day, but then started digging into it now and has made it his mission in life to teach people how to be just 10% happier. Do you think if you were 10% happier, your life would be better? His theory is that if you can learn about mindfulness, you can become 10% happier, but it's hard. So we shift from neuroscience to the way Buddhists think about your brain. They think the brain basically has a couple of weird things going on. The imperialistic tendency of the mind, is what the Buddhists call it, it means your mind is constantly wandering, that's the monkey mind, comparing you to other people and wanting the thing that you don't have. Sound like a challenge for anybody? The three things most of our brains do. Guess what teenagers do? 
wander, want the things they don't have, and constantly compare themselves, and we give them a phone to make it easier for them to compare themselves <laughs> to other people every minute of the day. How do you get around that? If you allow your monkey mind to take over and don't have that space between you and the things that are happening around you, then you just react. Anybody have road rage? I bicycle road rage once upon a time in my life. I lived in Washington, D.C., and as a bicycle commuter, I moved from the West Coast, and I assumed that cars understood bikes. <laughs> Turns out they do not. And for like the first six months, I would get cut off all the time. And I was that guy that would bike faster up to the intersection and bang on the side of the car and say, you almost ran me off the road and you not see me. What's wrong with you? Did it make me feel better? But I thought it was the thing I should do. At the time, I was teaching about leadership and learning about mindfulness, so I did an experiment for myself. I used to ride with headphones in, and I'd listen to a podcast. So I filled my brain all the time. I didn't like to be bored. And yet, one of the principles of mindfulness is we need to be bored. We need to create space. We need to give our brain the opportunity to daydream and to pull away if we want to have that skill. So for six weeks, I said, I will not put earphones in when I ride. Many of you just said, idiot, you shouldn't wear earphones when you ride a bike anyway. <laughs> but I allowed myself to be bored and just experience what was around me. Sights and sounds and process and daydream and just let my brain be bored. Guess what happened over six weeks of doing that? My ability to step away from my reactions to not let my amygdala get hijacked by the situation changed. So now when I got cut off, instead of losing my stuff, I was able to say, wow, I wasn't hurt, that was close. Probably an out-of-towner. Uh, maybe they've got something going on in their life, they're having a tough day, it's all good. That little couple seconds of step away creates space, change your ability to respond to a situation instead of react. Give me an example of how that would work in our setting. For a parent, what would be an example of reacting and getting your amygdala hijacked versus stepping away and responding appropriately? What's the thing that happens? In the gym or out? Either. When they don't do their chores and they're supposed to. Yeah. What do you feel? Oh, I'm so frustrated and angry. Is it likely the child is specifically not doing the chores to piss you off? No. Yes. <laughs> yes! 14 year old, maybe. It depends on the kid, but generally speaking, if you can step away, Give yourself a little bit of peace and then respond in an appropriate way. You're probably going to get much farther than if you go here. Because as soon as we do this, how good does that usually work out? Not at all. How about with your child's coach? Give me a thing a coach has done or you've seen that might have pissed off one of those bad parents, not us. Letting your child, letting another child mm -hmm. take another child. Oh, you let me, he got three turns and my daughter only got two turns. What's going on there? So what would be an appropriate response where you're a little more mindful and you step away from that? Start by assuming the best of the other. Don't assume everything's a conspiracy. <laughs> but step away from it and just ask yourself, okay, what's going on there? And then if you do need to confront, it's okay to ask us questions as coaches. How do you think I respond better as a coach? You only gave my kid two turns and the other kid got three turns. What is my natural response if I'm a human and somebody attacks you? <laughs> when we're attacked, we defend because of fight, flight, or freeze. And confrontation then becomes a contest, which I want to win. <laughs> a better thing for you is to step away, create a little space, assume best intent, and then ask a question in a calm way where I don't charge the situation with more emotional energy. Because guess what? When your amygdala gets hijacked and all that negative energy is going out, what happens with emotion? Did you know that it's biologically contagious? It's a thing. If I am raging and I just spend a couple seconds close to you, guess what your body starts to do automatically? It reflects that. At a cellular level, your body starts to get enraged as well. But if I don't have that, if I step away and go, hey, with my child today. I have one question about that drill. Totally different scenario. Same. Before I had my daughter, and I was just like, okay, like, oh, like, 
make your legs straight, wait your toes, do this, and even with my own daughter, why aren't you doing this, why aren't you doing this, and I've noticed that even with kids with regular low self-esteem, and I was okay, like, asking them, like, how are you feeling today, what's going through your mind, and just being able to kind of like, pick their brain a little bit, and like, how are you feeling today, what's going through your mind, and just being able to kind of like, see what's processing in their head, to understand why they're feeling like they don't want to do this skill, or this skill, or, you know, like, not telling them, and pinpointing everything. Well, you guys, thank you so much for attending. Uh, we will try to get this out for other people who really need this. Uh, probably more than the ones who showed up here, because <laughs> you're the ones who are seeking to improve. Um, and you know, what what I don't know now scares me because of what I didn't know two years ago, even and how much there's always something else to learn. And that's <coughs> great that you guys are, are seeking that knowledge to help you be a better parent. You know, that is be better. I think it's, I think it's great. So, Roberta.